The Old Testament reading for the eighth Sunday after Pentecost is from Amos chapter 7. This is what the Lord God showed me. Behold, the Lord was standing beside a wall built with a plumb line, with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a plumb line. Then the Lord said, Behold, I am setting a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will never again pass by them. The high places of Isaac shall be made desolate, and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste, and I will rise against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent to Jeroboam, king of Israel, saying, Amos has conspired against you in the midst of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all his words. For thus Amos has said, Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel must go into exile away from his land. And Amaziah said to Amos, O seer, go, flee away to the land of Judah and eat bread there and prophesy there. But never again prophesy at Bethel, for it is the king's sanctuary and it is a temple of the kingdom. Then Amos answered and said to Amaziah, I was no prophet nor a prophet's son, but I was a herdsman and a dresser of sycamore figs. But the Lord took me from following the flock and the Lord said to me, Go, prophesy to my people Israel. This is the word of the Lord. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. For from him and through him and to him are all things. The epistle is from Ephesians chapter 1. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us for adoption through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the Beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time, to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it, to the praise of his glory. This is the word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the sixth chapter. King Herod heard of it, for Jesus' name had become known. Some said, John the Baptist has been raised from the dead. That is why these miraculous powers are at work in him. But others said, he is Elijah. And others said, he is a prophet, like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. For it was Herod who had sent and seized John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife because he had married her. For John had been saying to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to put him to death. But she could not, for Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he kept him safe. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he heard him gladly. But an opportunity came when Herod, on his birthday, gave a banquet for his nobles and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. For when Herodias' daughter came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. 
And the king said to the girl, Ask me for whatever you wish, and I will give it to you. And he vowed to her, Whatever you ask me, I will give you, up to half of my kingdom. And she went out and said to her mother, Well, what should I ask? And she said, The head of John the Baptist. And she came in immediately with haste to the king and asked, saying, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And the king was exceedingly sorry, but because of his oath and his guest, he did not want to break his word to her. And immediately the king sent an executioner with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in the prison and brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl, and the girl gave it to her mother. When his disciples heard of it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. This is the gospel of the Lord. We confess our Christian faith together in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated. The children are invited to come forward for the children's message. We're all down here. Good morning. How's everybody doing this morning? Good. Can everybody see this? Can you tell what I brought today? What does this look like? A digital picture frame. Ooh, very good. Somebody thought it looked like a TV last night. Oh, well, it's a little bit small for a TV, but it does kind of look like a TV. And the principle is the same, right? When you when this is working, you you see pictures on the frame, like it's almost like they're coming, like it's a TV. If the pictures go across the frame and, and they replace one another. How come it's not working now? Yeah. Yes? It's not plugged in. Yes, okay. One of the things you learn is that if something is electric, right, we need to plug it in to a power source before it will work. If there's no power to it, if it's not connected, then it doesn't work, okay? So I'm going to try to plug this in. We have a power source over here. I'm going to try to plug this in, and let's see if it works. Did I get anything? No. Oh. It's warming up. You should start to see pictures. Here they come. Can you tell what that is? This is a Vacation Bible School picture from several years ago. The, the, where there was a robot theme in the Vacation Bible School that year, and uh, the, the kids are dressing up like robots. Okay, So they had boxes for shoes and, and things like that. Okay, So there's a whole bunch of pictures on here. Th these, these are really old pictures. I haven't updated them for a while. But um, 
there'll be s there if if we went all the way through it, we would uh, we would see some confirmation pictures too. I'm going to unplug it now. So what happens when I unplug it? The pictures go off, right? Okay, because it's not connected to a power source anymore. Okay, uh, our lesson from Ephesians today, the second lesson we had in church, talks about the importance of being connected. Okay, now the word connected didn't appear in there, but there was this little word in that that was in the lesson several times, and it was always saying something about in Christ or in Him. Okay, so what that's telling us is that when we are coming to church and we, when we're receiving God's gifts and uh, His His especially His gift of forgiveness of sins and eternal life in heaven. We have to be connected to Jesus in order to receive those gifts, okay? Because without Jesus, we don't have eternal life in heaven. We don't have forgiveness of sins, okay? How do we get connected to Jesus? Well, when we're baptized, that's when the connection gets started, right? We get, we get connected to Jesus in our baptism, okay? The connection that we have is faith. And the Holy Spirit, when we are baptized, gives us faith in Jesus. We believe in him as our Savior. So when we believe in him and we are connected to Jesus and we, we hear his word and we believe his, his word, we, we get all the blessings that God has to give us. Okay? But like the pictures don't come up when, we're not, when it's not plugged in, okay? when, we're, when we are not connected, to, if, if people are not connected to Jesus, they don't get those blessings, okay? Vacation Bible School is coming up. Cub Weeks is coming up this week. Those are good ways to connect people to Jesus, okay? Um, Vacation Bible School, we have a lot of children in our community that come that might not go to church anyway, okay? But they come here to Vacation Bible School so we can connect them to Jesus. We can tell them about Jesus. And hopefully, the Holy Spirit is working faith in some of those children so that they believe in him. Maybe later they'll get baptized if they're not baptized already. And, and they can know Jesus too. So we hope you will all come to our Vacation Bible School this year. But even more, we hope that, that, uh, that uh, you will bring friends or, or invite the children that you know to come to our Vacation Bible School so that they can come and, and be connected to Jesus too. Okay. Um, we're not going to have a robot theme this year. It's a water theme this year. It's Splash Canyon. So that'll be interesting. Maybe we'll talk about baptism, huh? If it's Splash Canyon this fall. Okay. I've got a, a treat to, uh, to send you back with today. So uh, if you want to go back to your seats, and we can uh, sing the next hymn. You can pick one from there. You can starburst, blue and red and purple. Jesus, priceless treasure, fount of purest pleasure, truest friend to me. Ah, how long in anguish shall my spirit languish, yearning, Lord, for thee. Thou art mine, O Lamb divine, I will suffer not to hide thee. Not I ask beside thee. In thine arms I rest me, foes who 
death, O sin, and hell assail me. Jesus will not fail me. Satan, I defy thee. Death, I now decry thee. Fear, I bid thee cease. World, thou shalt not harm me, nor thy threats alarm me, while I sing of peace. God's great power guards every hour, earth and all its depths adore him. Silence bow before him. Hence all earthly treasure, Jesus is my pleasure, Jesus is my choice. Hence all empty glory, not to me thy story, told with tempting voice. Pain or loss or shame or cross shall not from my Savior move me since he deigns to love me. Evil world I leave Thou canst not deceive me, thine appeal is vain. Sin that once did blind me, get thee far behind me, come not forth again. Pass thy hour, O pride and power, Sinful life, thy bonds I sever. Leave thee now forever. Hence all fear and sadness for the Lord of gladness, Jesus enters in. Grace, mercy, and peace be to all of you from God our Father, from our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The word of God in which we base our meditation this morning is from the epistle lesson, is the epistle lesson from Ephesians chapter 1. We hear again verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. This is the word of the Lord. Dear friends in Christ, if you want a bit of trivia, and this, this really doesn't mean much, but I'm a numbers guy, so I noticed this. Uh, the hymn we just sang is number 743. In the old Lutheran hymnal, it was 347, which is exactly backwards. I don't know how many hymns there are that can say that, but now you have the worthless trivia for the day. On to more... Uh, to less trivial things, the, uh, the following story appeared in, uh, several years ago in the Fort Dodge Messenger. It's a fairly long story, but it illustrates well what Paul is talking about in our, les in our text today. A wealthy man and his son loved to collect rare works of art. They had everything in their collection, from Raphael to Picasso. They would often sit together and admire the great works of art that they had. 
When the Vietnam conflict broke out, the son went to war. He was a very courageous soldier, and he died in battle while rescuing another soldier. The father was notified, and he grieved deeply for his only son. About a month later, just before Christmas, there was a knock at his front door, and a young man stood at the door with a very large package in his hand. He said, sir, you don't know me, but I am the soldier for whom your son gave his life. He saved many lives that day, and he was carrying me to safety when a bullet struck him in the heart, and he died instantly. He often talked about you and your love for art. Then the young man held out his package, and he said, I know it's not much. I'm not a great artist, but I think your son would have wanted you to have this. The father opened the package, and it was a portrait of his son painted by the young man. The father stared at the way, in awe at the way the soldier had captured the personality of his son in the painting. His eyes welled up with tears. He thanked the young man and offered to pay him for the picture. Oh, no, sir, I could never repay you for what your son did for me. It's a gift. The father hung the portrait over the mantel, and every time visitors came to the house, he would take them to see the portrait of his son before he showed them any of his other great works in his collection. A few months later, the man died. There was to be a great auction of his paintings. Many influential people gathered, excited to see the great paintings and for the opportunity to purchase one for their collection. On the platform sat the painting of the sun. The auctioneer pounded his gavel. We will start the bidding with this picture of the sun. Who will bid for this picture? There was silence. Then a voice in the back of the room shouted, We want to see the famous painting. Skip this one. The auctioneer persisted. Who will start the bidding for this picture? $100. $200. Another voice shouted angrily, We came to see the Van Goghs, the Rembrandts. Get on with the real bids. But still the auctioneer continued, The sun, the sun. Who will take the sun? Finally, a voice came from the back of the room. It was the longtime gardener of the man and his son. I'll give $10 for it. It was all he could afford. The auctioneer accepted the bid. We have $10. Who will give $20? Give it to him for $10. Let's see the master. $10 is the bid. Won't someone bid $20? The crowd was becoming angry at all this fuss over the picture of the son. They wanted the more worthy investments for their collections. The auctioneer pounded his gavel. Going once, going twice, sold for $10. A man sitting in the second row shouted, now let's get on with the collection. The auctioneer laid down his gavel. I'm sorry, the auction is over. The crowd was stunned. But what about the painting? I'm sorry. When I was called to conduct this auction, I was told of a secret stipulation in the will. I was not allowed to reveal the stipulation until this time. Only the painting of of the sun was to be auctioned. Whoever bought that painting would inherit the entire estate, including the other paintings. So the auction is over. Whoever has the sun gets everything. God gave his son 2,000 years ago to die on a cruel cross. Much like the auctioneer, his message today is, the son, the son, who will take the son? Because, you see, whoever has the son gets everything. St. Paul proclaimed this good news many years ago when he wrote to the Ephesian Christians, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. In our lesson for today, Paul lists many of these spiritual blessings, and he uses the phrase in Christ or a variation such as in him ten times. That must mean that in Christ is important. In fact, we might refer to it as the Christ connection. Our connection to God and to the wonderful blessings that he has given us is in Christ. Whoever has God's Son gets all of God's blessings. But you know, in our day and age, many people don't want the sun. There is a great interest in spirituality today. 
Despite our abundance of material things in this country, many people are unfulfilled. They are looking for things like inner peace, a sense of hope, a sense of belonging, a sense of meaning and purpose in life. They are looking for answers to questions to which only God has the answers. But they are looking in the wrong places. Some are looking in all kinds of self-help techniques. Some look to meditation and yoga, hoping to find God in their inner selves. Some are fascinated with angels, not, see, not seeing them as God's servants protecting believers, but as beings who can mediate between them and God. Some make God the God of some noble cause, like saving the environment or achieving world peace. But God cries out, the son, the son, who will take my son? In our quest to know God, we have made God into whatever we want him to be. The world thinks of God as some generic God who accepts worship from Christians and Muslims and Buddhists and Hindus and Jews and New Agers and everybody else and will ultimately save everybody, no matter what they believe. The world thinks of Jesus as nothing more than a good man, a great teacher, or an example for us to follow, an example of love and compassion for our fellow man. But God cries out, the son, the son, who will take my son? Even we Christians sometimes have ourselves convinced that we don't need the son. The world has all but eliminated the idea of sin. We decide what is right and wrong ourselves. We Christians say we believe in the Ten Commandments, in God's standards of right and wrong, but even we try to decide our own standards of right and wrong sometimes. We justify living together unmarried because society accepts it now. Judging from church attendance in the summer, some Christians seem to believe that the Third Commandment gives them the summer off. And, of course, the Eighth Commandment forbids others from talking about us behind our backs, but it's okay for us to vent about them when they're not around. If those things aren't sin, then we don't need to repent. If those things aren't sin, then we don't need the Son. And indeed, many Lutherans believe even that if they live a decent life and do the best they can, God will accept them and let them into heaven. But God cries out, the Son, the Son, who will take the Son? Because, you see, whoever has the Son gets everything, but whoever doesn't have the Son is left empty-handed. We have no inalienable right to God's blessings on our own. We are, in fact, sinners who have rejected God and his blessing. We have forfeited our relationship with him. But still God cries out, The son, the son, here, take my son. He doesn't auction his son to the highest bidder. He offers him to all by grace. Take my son by faith. Believe in him and receive every spiritual blessing, the fruits of his whole works for your salvation. Listen to St. Paul describe some of those blessings. God chose us in Christ before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. What does it feel like to be chosen? What does it feel like to have your artwork chosen for a poster at school? What does it feel like to be chosen for a promotion at work? You feel wanted. You feel important. God chose you in Christ. He wanted you. You are important to him. Before he created the world, he wanted you to be his own. He chose you for a purpose, to be holy and blameless in his sight. We are not holy and blameless on our own, but in Christ, God made us that way. We trust in Christ who suffered and died for our sins, and God declares us holy, blameless, innocent of all sin. Paul says that God also predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Christ. We who were once isolated from God and from one another in sin have a place to belong. We are in God's family. We are family together with our fellow believers. As sons and daughters of God, we are his heirs, heirs of the riches of his grace. In Christ, we have redemption through his blood. To redeem means to buy back. In Bible times, it referred to the price, the ransom price, that was paid for a slave in order to make him a free man. Jesus paid the price to ransom us from sin and death and make us free. 
That price was his own life, his blood, which he shed for us on the cross. He was like the art collector's son, obediently and and courageously battling sin, death, and the devil on our behalf, taking the bullet for us while carrying us to safety, giving his life that we might live. In him we have the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace. The Bible pictures forgiveness in many ways. God removes our sins as far from us as east is from west. He drowns our sins in the depths of the sea. He casts them behind his back so that he cannot see them. He has selective memory loss. He remembers our sins no more. And in accordance with the riches of his grace, he does this time after time after time. Every time we sin because his son has paid the price for our ransom. God chose to do all of this long ago. It was all according to his plan for us, that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be for the praise of his glory. Not only that we might by our lives of love express our thanks to God for saving us, but that others might see what Christ has done in our lives and that they might have the Son too. We have a guarantee that all of this is true. God has given us the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has brought us to faith through the word, the gospel of our salvation. God has marked us with the Holy Spirit, his seal of ownership, his guarantee that we belong to him and that all these blessings are ours. The Holy Spirit is the stipulation in God's will that whoever gets the Son has it all, including the gift of eternal life in heaven. It's the Christ connection. Our connection to God and his endless blessings is by faith in Jesus Christ, his Son. That connection has been established with you by hearing and believing God's word and in your baptism, which has joined you to Christ who has died and risen again for for you. But God also desires that you and I remain plugged in to Christ. We don't want to get disconnected from him. That's why we attend worship and Bible class, so that we can continue hearing and believing God's word. That's why as individuals we take time to study God's word for ourselves. And as families we make time to share God's word at home and in family devotions. So that the Holy Spirit can keep us connected. That's why we at Christ's invitation take the opportunity often to partake of his body and blood in Holy Communion. That he may strengthen that faith connection and live in us. The Son, the Son, who will take the Son? By grace through faith, you and I have that saving relationship with the Son, Jesus Christ. Now we have that message to share with the world. The Son, the Son, who will take the Son? In the Son of God, Jesus Christ, are all the answers the world is so desperately seeking. In Him is true peace. In Him is certain hope. In Him is a sense of belonging and a sense of meaning and purpose in life. For you see, whoever has the Son gets everything. Amen. The peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. You may be seated as the offering is received.